Hello and welcome everyone to our Neo4j webinar, RDBMS to Graph. My name is Corey Brickman, Marketing Community Manager here at Neo4j, and I'm delighted to welcome Ryan Boyd, our Developer Advocate here at Neo, and we're both excited to bring you today's presentation. A few housekeeping items before we get started. You can ask any questions that you have using the questions box located in your GoToWebinar control panel, and we'll get to a live Q&A session right at the end of today's presentation, so feel free to submit those at your leisure. We'll also be sending you a follow-up email with the slides and the recording of this presentation, so be sure to look out for that tomorrow in your email box. And with that, I will go ahead and hand it over to Ryan. Hello, everyone. I'm excited to be here today to talk about Neo4j uh, and talk about how you convert from a relational model to a graph model. As Corey said, my name is Ryan Boyd. You can reach me online at Twitter at RyGuyRG, that's R-Y-G-U-Y-R-G, or you can email me at ryan at neo4j.com. All right, so let's get into it. From relational to graph. Data used to be stored like this, punch tape or punch cards. Really, this is a horrible, horrible way to read and understand data. It's impossible to index easily or cross-reference or eliminate inconsistencies. So as an industry, we kept on developing and we started to store data in tables or, quote, relational databases. Sometimes those tables are human readable, but as soon as you normalize the data to eliminate duplication and inconsistencies, many fields start referencing auto-generated numerical foreign keys. And your data becomes difficult to understand and maintain without many complicated join queries. I've talked to many developers who have join queries, which are 20, 30, 40, tables uh, in the single join. And that is a, a horribly inefficient way to write code and definitely much worse for those folks that are trying to maintain it. So our industry advanced. There became the NoSQL revolution, which decided to make it easier to store and access large amounts of data and also make it easier for developers to write code which interacts in it with that data in a more developer-friendly way. And graph databases came along. Really, the future is now. So we've taken this revolution through from punch tape to relational databases to other NoSQL databases. And graph databases are the next step. Graph databases, like Neo4j, store data in a much more logical way a way that represents the real world and prioritizes the representation, discoverability, and maintainability of data relationships. So we think of three different goals when it comes to a database. And those three goals are intuitiveness, speed, and agility. Let's talk about the first one, intuitiveness. Intuitiveness is about making the data model easy for everyone to understand. With Neo4j and graph databases, the data model that you would draw up on a whiteboard during a business discussion is the same model as we store in the underlying database. We like to call this that the uh, logical model is the physical model, or the whiteboard model is the physical model. And this makes it a lot easier for the business folks and developers to communicate uh, and to get things implemented quickly without that translation layer between the business folks and the developer. And then we have speed. Speed is about making your queries faster, about being more responsive to your customers. We have a customer, eBay, who wrote this quote that they found Neo4j to be literally thousands of times faster than their previous MySQL solution. And the queries are requiring less code. This is important. You have both speed of development as well as the speed of execution of the queries in order to be more responsive to your customers. 
and agility. Agility means a naturally adaptive model. Neo4j we like to call schema optional. And what that means is that with Neo4j, you can choose to enforce some levels of schema in your database, or you can choose to make it optional. And what that means is that it's a lot faster to adapt your database to new data that's coming in. As your business changes, you can easily adapt your data model by adding new relationships or new nodes or new properties, which you're going to learn about here shortly. But agility also means that you have a query language that's designed to query connected data. It's designed with relationships at the forefront. And uh, you know, that query language is something we call Cypher. This is a real query from one of our customers. The goal of this query is to find all of the direct reports within an organization but going many level levels down in the organization. So for each level in the organization that they want to go, they've actually done a union statement here uh, to union in the results from the next level down. Now, I'm not going to deny that there's, there's easier ways to write this query in SQL. That's certainly true. Um, but this is the type of query that real customers are writing and trying to maintain in their databases. Now, they migrated over to Neo4j and wrote the same query in Cypher in something that looks like this. So we went from 100 lines at like an 18 point font here, or sorry, like 8 point font here, to about 6 lines, um, or 5 if you can count correctly. And uh, that's, really, uh, that's really an important thing for developers to maintain their code and adapt to the changing business is to make it a lot easier to make those adaptations. So this means that your developers spend less time writing queries, less time debugging those queries, and the code is easier to read. So a brief interlude for more information about me as well as to give you my email address and Twitter handle again. Uh, I've developed web applications. Uh, I say five years here. That's a very conservative estimate because that was my full-time job for five years. Uh, but then I've worked at Google for eight years on Google Apps and our cloud platform technologies. Uh, and now I'm here at Neo because I really do believe that a graph database model is a better way to store vastly different types of data. Uh, many people think that the use cases are limited to just social, but I'm going to show you otherwise here in a second. Uh, but I work with a variety of different technologies, and you're seeing some of that here today. So in terms of use cases, yes, it's more than just social. What types of use cases do we find the most popular with Neo4j? Well, we have real-time recommendations, master data management, fraud detection, graph-based search, network and IT operations, and identity and access management. So I'm going to show you some of those here today and show you what those graphs may look like. Uh, and I'm going to encourage you to take those graphs and take the data that I talk about and to see how that applies within your organization. Um, these use cases are used across a wide variety of industries, and the definition of real-time recommendations to your company might be totally different than the definition of that to, say, a retailer, but you can apply these same models. So for real-time recommendations, uh, the goal here, uh, as we're showing in the graph on the right-hand side, is to understand and recommend products to someone. So if the person at the left bought a plant uh, and viewed a, uh, a watering, <laughs> what is that called? Wow, anyway, and viewed a, uh, an ability to water plants, uh, someone else bought that and then also uh, viewed a bucket. So it may be that you want to recommend a bucket to the first person. And this is a very simplistic model. This is just basing it off of views and purchases. But in real-time recommendations in the retail world, what we see people doing is actually incorporating a lot larger set of data when doing those recommendations. We see people incorporating things like 
inventory, what inventory is left and where is that inventory located. Logistics, can we get the product delivered in time for the holiday or event that user is likely looking for. Weather patterns, similar. There are certain items that are better to recommend during certain weather patterns in certain areas. Incorporating uh, information from complaints and our, our ticketing system. So has that user complained about a product or a brand in the past, or has that user returned a lot of products from a certain manufacturer in the past. We might not want to recommend those products to that user. And all sorts of other systems that you can incorporate in this graph and understand those relationships in order to make better recommendations to users. This is exactly what Walmart is doing with Neo4j. Walmart is using Neo4j to power one of their websites and they are doing this because they can provide much better recommendations. So master data management. It's a use case um, that kind of covers a lot of area, but if you can think about it, um, we're gonna talk later in the relational to graph part about how an organization data is stored. Things like their customers and their salespeople and the orders that that, uh, that that group has purchased. But master data management also means making internal processes better within an organization and making it easier to solve problems for your customers. Cisco actually uses us for this. Uh, Neo4j is the heart of the Cisco HMP. Uh, it's used to have a single source of truth and a one-stop shop for Cisco's hierarchies. It is the heart of their help desk solution as well in order to recommend the right content. Now you can argue that this is recommendations or master data management, but the goal here is to make a, a organization to be more responsive to their customers, provide them the right data faster, and then save costs internally so that you don't need to have as many help desk representatives because you're supplying the right data to your customers. Fraud detection. This is a really important use case for us. We don't have many customers, quote unquote, on record for this, as you can imagine why people don't like knowing, uh, or people knowing how they do their fraud detection. But our customers here include some of the world's leading investment banks uh, and insurance companies and things like that. And this is all about understanding not just the the pattern of activity in a discrete way, but understanding the pattern of relationships between the objects in a transaction. So in this case here, we have a person who has opened an account uh, and issued a credit card and lives in a house. And then we have another person who has opened an account and issued the same credit card and lives in the same house and has this other card. Well, what would happen here uh, if you expect, uh, or sorry, suspected fraudulent activity is with a graph database, you'd be able to understand each of these different components and how they link together and say, there might be one element here that uh, is abnormal. It may be abnormal for two people to share the same social security number or a dozen people to share the same address. And you can see those connections really easily in a graph database and in the code that you write then to detect them in the future. So this is a quote from a leading cybersecurity expert who says that graph databases offer new methods of uncovering fraud rings and other sophisticated scams with a high level of accuracy and they're capable of stopping advanced fraud scenarios in real time. And that's what it's all about, making it faster and faster to solve these problems, rather than doing these things in batch jobs where it may be too late, you may have already shipped out a product, um, you can do them in real time and prevent the loss to your organization then and there. So graph-based search. 
Graph-based search is a very important use case for us, and this is actually where Neo4j originated from. Back when founders uh, were in Sweden before they moved to Silicon Valley, um, they had a use case where they were building up a library of images, and they wanted people to be able to search those images in an intelligent way. So if you think about an image of a dog, and you could tag that image of a dog with the word dog, but you also want to recognize the hierarchy of terms. So if someone instead searched for animal, you would show the images of dogs and cats and other things. If someone searched for mammal, you would show the images of dogs and cats and, and other mammals. And uh, you wouldn't need to actually record the idea that dog is a mammal every single time that you put a new photo into the system because the system would understand the hierarchy of terms. And so graph-based search is oftentimes used to do things like finding routes um, or it's also used to do things like finding media. And one of our customers here is LaFonza who uses graph-based search to understand the digital assets inside of its flight entertainment system. Network and IT operations. This is a, a really powerful use case as well because they are naturally networks. Graphs are networks, networks are graphs. And so you want to understand what the dependencies are in your network as an example. So if you were to have a part of your network go down, let's say that you're going to do maintenance on one of your databases, can you understand all of the different services which are going to be impacted by making that database non-operational and then notify the owners in advance that you're going to be doing service on that database? That is a very helpful thing for you to be able to do and you see easily. There's also root cause analysis. If you see a bunch of things that are broken and you haven't yet determined what is the cause of those things being broken, you can decide what are the common dependencies or what are the common potential root causes between all of the things that are down. And it allows you to investigate faster. As we expand to microservices in this industry and have a lot of different machines uh, or virtual machines or containers that are depending on each other, understanding the connections between them becomes even more important. There's an open source technology divided, uh, developed by the folks at Lending Club, and it's called MacGyver, um, like the, the TV show character. Uh, and you might want to check that out if you're interested in network and IT operations, because that is software that they've written to do this type of thing internal to their IT group, but then released as open source. We also have other companies, such as HP, using Neo4j for network topology. And then we have identity and access management. So when I developed web applications, we maintained the permissions for all the users, it was at a university, in an LDAP structure. An LDAP structure is a tree. You have OUs that define each level of the organization, and a person, an account, is in one OU. So uh, in the case of someone who is a student, faculty, and staff, uh, because a person strictly had to be one in one and only one OU, we had no way to record that in the LDAP structure. So instead, we actually created different accounts for each of these different roles, and that's inefficient. We also have many customers who use us uh, because they have super large hierarchy of permissions, a group within a group within a group within a group within a group, within a group and so on. And it became hard in real time to determine what that hierarchy is and how it should be navigated and whether the user should have access to their data. And so because it became really in performance for them to do that, they switched to a batch job. And thus the data was out of date. If someone's privilege was added or removed, then it might be 12 or 24 hours before they have access. Well, now they've switched over to Neo4j and are able to navigate this graph structure in real time to understand the user's privileges. 
and it just makes their organization more efficient. UBS is one of our customers who use us uh, for identity and access management. So many different verticals. I'm not going to go through each of these. Uh, I want to get really on to the, the SQL and, and RDBMS to graph part of this, but Neo4j is used in many different verticals in addition to many different use cases. So I've talked about the use cases. Now I'm going to go through and talk about pains that developers have with SQL and then talk about how you develop a Neo4j application and move from your relational to graph models and walk through an example of that, that transition. And then talk about how you create data in graphs and query data in graphs should we have enough time. I do want to point out here that we're going to see some diagrams throughout this presentation uh, with some handwriting on it. I promised uh, this young gentleman that I would give him credit for doing that handwriting. And so hopefully you won't blame me if that handwriting is illegible. I promise it wasn't me who drew the handwriting. Now let's talk about the day in the life of a relational database developer. A developer who's thinking about SQL. This is her ideal table. It's a table of people and where they're from, their hair color, the university they attended. This table is fairly natural, but it's duplicating values across multiple rows. We can see the country UK is included multiple times and the university Princeton is included multiple times. So let's say that you wanted to change the name of one of those countries or more likely change the name of one of those universities you'd have to update all rows. So let's normalize this. We create another table, and this other table has primary keys for each of the countries, which is these numerical auto-generated numbers, and the country names. And because we separated this out to a different table, we can also add some additional information, such as the leader of the country. This is fantastic, but then as we go back to the original table, we have to reference with a foreign key to the primary key in the country table. And the table here now becomes a little bit harder to read and to maintain and to get new people who are on the project to understand. And now we're gonna do the same thing with our universities and add the name of the leader or the president of the university, the state the university is in. But again, reference this from the main table using a foreign key relationship. So now we have two foreign key relationships specified and uh, if we went into the hair, we'd have another foreign key relationship, perhaps including the color of the hair and maybe the genes that are often responsible for giving you a certain color hair or the countries uh, that that hair color uh, is prominent in. But um, as you keep on doing this, you can see that we're at a table that becomes hard to read and hard to maintain. So we can do things like create an ER diagram or a very simplified one here and show the references between all the individual tables. Helpful, um, but now imagine that instead of three tables here, we had a dozen. Imagine that as you did your SQL query to query this data, Instead of two joins here, we have 11 join statements. It becomes a lot more difficult to understand and maintain. And this leaves your SQL developer thinking about joins. She's thinking about joins all day long. She's thinking about joins all night long, and it's keeping her up, and it's making her less productive. But we can do one thing. Instead of just making uh, the SQL developer less productive, uh, or in addition to that, we can actually improve the productivity of the database. Because on each one of these join statements, if you have no indexes defined, it's going to do a full table scan of that table. Well, let's define some indexes. We can add indexes, and now as we perform a join, say with 20 different tables in that join statement, it will actually look at the indexes for each of those tables in order to perform that join operation. This makes it more efficient, 
but it's still expensive if we're having to look up in 20 different indexes. So what do we do? If we're trying to add more performance to our database that was in this structure, and we add all of these joins in, and we add all of the indexes to help the joins, and our data still isn't being returned fast enough. Well, we denormalize the data. We create a table that looks something like this. And once again, we have the problem of maintaining and keeping consistency with our data, but we've increased the performance. All of these things are trade-offs. So I contend that SQL makes it complex to model and store relationships. Although SQL is meant for accessing relational databases, the word relational is really laid on top of a table, column, and row structure, and not on top of something that is a truly representative of the relationships. Your performance degrades as you increase your data because you have to do those uh, index lookups on every join. Your queries get long and complex, and maintenance becomes difficult. Graphs make it, alternatively, much easier to model and store your relationships. The performance of relationship traversal remains constant as you grow in data size, and this is what's really important. So Neo4j has what we call index-free adjacency. What that means is you're hopping from one relationship to another relationship to another relationship. We are not looking at indexes for each of those hops. We are essentially doing pointer arithmetic. We're essentially saying advance 34 bytes or advance another 34 bytes. And this makes it a lot faster to traverse your graph over those relationships. And this is the primary reason a lot of our customers use Neo4j, is because of the performance benefits they get as they traverse the graph, as they traverse relationships, which would be very expensive to do on a large scale in a relational database. The queries are shortened and more readable. You saw one example earlier in Cypher compared to SQL. I'm going to show you some more examples here later. And we can make it a lot easier to do adding of additional properties and relationships on the fly without any schema migrations, which is another thing that would keep your SQL developer up at night. For those of you that know John Resig, he's the creator of jQuery, one of the most popular libraries used on the internet today. And he likes Neo4j because he was able to convert a bunch of analysis scripts, analysis scripts he was doing into a handful of Cypher queries. So what does this graph that we keep on talking about look like? Well, let's give an example here. Let's say that we have a woman named Anne who loves a gentleman named Dan. And I actually switched that around here in this slide. I apologize. So in this case, I'm saying Dan loves Anne. So we create a node, which is the noun, the person in this case. Uh, we create a person node that has a property named Dan. And we say that that person node who has a property named Dan loves, loves is the relationship, a person who has a name property of Anne. It's quite simple. This is all we would need to do in Cypher to create those two nodes and the relationship between them. Now, Neo4j is uh, directional in its relationships. So in this case here, I'm indicating that Dan loves Anne, but I'm not indicating that Anne loves Dan back. While that might be very sad, it's possible that Dan loves Anne and, and not vice versa. So it's encoding that one-way relationship. With Neo4j, you can query the relationships in either direction. So I could query that there is a loves relationship between Dan and Anne, regardless of direction. In this case, though, if Anne does love Dan back, I might create another relationship saying Anne loves Dan. Or perhaps add a property on the loves relationship that says this love is mutual. Now, this is an important thing to note. Um, and there are cases when you create relationships in Neo4j 
uh, where you want to create the relationship in both directions. But if you have something like a Facebook model where someone is a friend of another person, you would only record, because that relationship is bi-directional and always bi-directional, you would only record the relationship in one direction and then query regardless of the direction. So if we step back here, now that we know what graphs look like, we step back and look at that original data source that we talked about with the table of people and their hair color and their university, we would get a graph that looks something like this. This graph has a person who lives in a country. That person went to a university. That university is located in a state. And that university is led by a president or leader. And then we also have that person lives in a country. Uh, and that state is located in that country. So it's a very simple relationship here. It's easy for you to read. It's easy for you to add new members to your team and for them to understand what's going on in your database. And most importantly, it's easy to query. This is the Cypher query. We call Cypher, which is a declarative query language optimized for relationships. We call it ASCII art for graphs. So you'll see that pattern here, for those of you who are familiar with ASCII art you can see that there's the arrow pattern. You, you're creating arrows from one node to another node with a relationship in between. So in the second line on this screen here, we have person, and we're using the alias called P. That can be whatever you want, uh, but in this case, we're using P. That person went to a university aliased as you. And so we can see that relationship pattern created as artwork. Um, and then the, the third line here is saying where that person lives in a country. And then that university is led by a leader. That university is located in a state. And the state's abbreviation is Connecticut. You're actually drawing out the patterns of relationships that you want to see, which makes it a lot easier to understand this. This is a quote from a gentleman named David Meza. He says, I love Neo4j because I can explore relationships faster than you can say SQL join. Now, David Meza is not just any developer. David Meza works for NASA. He's the chief knowledge architect of NASA, and NASA knows its technology. So I just wanted to point this out because it's a highly credible quote from someone who's been around a lot of different technology. So how do you use Neo4j? Well, first of all, you create your initial model of how you want to import your data. And then you load your data into Neo4j, and then you query your data. You can query your data using what's called the Neo4j browser, which is built into the product. It looks something like this. It is a web application that allows you to query data. And you can do this. Uh, but this, this tool, this Neo4j browser, is intended for developers. It is intended for folks like you who are building your graph database. It is not intended for end users. So Neo4j is an ACID-compliant transactional database. It's meant to store your most critical data. And we give you tools that allow you to work with that data as a developer. But the end goal is putting that data into your applications, making your applications more powerful through use of that data. So the typical way that most people are using Neo4j is by writing code which accesses it. Now, Neo4j has an API, and that API allows you to access Neo4j from a huge variety of programming languages, from JavaScript, from Java, from Ruby, from .NET, from Python, from PHP. There are even drivers contributed by the community for other languages like Haskell and Go. So these all allow you to write those cipher queries, the declarative queries, and query Neo4j. Now, Cypher queries, like any query language, have a query planner that optimizes the query that you can 
to access your graph. And with Neo4j, that query planner is getting faster and faster, release by release. We have a whole team dedicated to making those queries as fast as possible. But if you want to squeeze every last millisecond out of Neo4j, you can also write native server-side extensions in Java that plan your query manually, where you specify how to traverse the graph in your Java code. This allows you to squeeze that every last millisecond out and make as fast applications as possible. Here's another quote. Uh, this gentleman does not work for NASA as far as I know, uh, but he can't believe that Neo4j is actually real. It seems like a dream come true to him. So what architectural options do we have when we're building Neo4j? We've talked about how you can get your data into Neo4j. Uh, you design your model and you query your data through either the browser or uh, your code. But where is Neo4j sitting from an infrastructure perspective? Neo4j often sits in a polyglot environment. And what that means is that your application accesses a variety of databases. It might access Redis, it might access Mongo or Cassandra, in addition to your existing SQL databases like Oracle or Postgres or MySQL. And it's using each of those databases to uh, perform operations which are best suited for those databases. So in this case here, we have our set of databases that are application accesses and uh, that accesses Neo4j in a clustered environment. Neo4j Enterprise Edition is a clustered HA environment. Because it's meant for these asset transactions and your most critical data, we want to make sure that that data is replicated across multiple machines, and if any failover occurs, that the database remains operation. So your application accesses that Neo4j cluster, but we also have our data, center, our data scientists sitting on the side here and accessing your data as well, and possibly using Neo4j and other things along with bulk analytic infrastructure such as Hadoop. So your data scientist discovers these patterns and then encodes the patterns in your application code with your developer and makes sure that you then have real-time responses to your queries in the future. Now you can migrate your data from relational to graph in a couple different ways. We have some customers who migrate everything. Uh, they move all of their data from a relational database to a graph database because their data is not very table-like at all. Their data is very much dependent upon the relationships between the data. We have other folks who migrate only a subset. Um, and then their application performs the non-graph queries, the things that are much more tabular, over to the relational database and the graph queries over to the graph database. And then we have people that just mirror the two data sets. Uh, so they take all of their data uh, and move it from Neo, or sorry, from the relational database to Neo4j and keep those two things in sync and then leave it up to the application developer as to where to query the data from. So how do we move from relational to graph? Well, let's say that we have an ER diagram that looks something like this. Now, I don't know about for you guys, for me, ER diagrams make me a little sad. It's a bunch of these relationships that are linked up by these artificial foreign keys. Um, and yeah, sure, it is showing the relationships between your data, but without seeing the actual data, it becomes difficult. Um, and there are tables here that are not even really necessary um, as you logically think about your data. So we're gonna show you with the Northwind data set. Now, I hope many of you are familiar with Northwind. Northwind is the canonical relational database example. Northwind is an example that Microsoft developed along with SQL Server uh, many years ago, and uh, it is supposed to demonstrate the power of relational databases. Now, if you saw me here in the studio that we're recording this in, you would see me put relational in air quotes because I truly believe that Northwind is much better as a graph database. 
And I'm going to show you that with a graph model and then step by step through uh, this model or the conversion process. So here is the model. We have an employee who reports to another employee, an employee who represents a territory. That territory is in a region. We can have employee sell an order, which includes products. The products are in categories. A supplier supplies that product. And then that order was shipped by a shipper. So I contend that Northwind is better represented as a graph. Now, if we start with this ER diagram, what do we do to convert relational to graph? First of all, we locate our foreign keys. And these are those artificial foreign key relationships that map one table to the next. We take those foreign keys and we drop them out. And we replace them with relationships. So you can see here we have products uh, are in categories. And we see that relationship between products and categories and suppliers supply products, we see that relationship on the left-hand side. So our next thing we're going to be doing is finding the join tables. Finding the join tables uh, is finding the tables that are really just linking up two other tables, and that's their only purpose. Excuse me. And for this case, we have employees who represent territories, and we have this very simple join table called employee territories. And for that very simple join table called employee territories on the right hand side, we are going to convert that over into the represent relationship. An employee represents a territory. But we have this more complex join table at the top left. This is an attributed join table. It describes for each product that is in an order what the unit price is, what the quantity is, what the discount is, and all of that information is described there. So we're going to convert that over into a relationship called includes. So an order includes products, and then we're going to specify some properties on that relationship, the unit price, the quantity, and the discount. So I'm going to show you some example queries, but these queries are only going to represent a subset of the overall graph. Uh, this just makes it easier to fit everything on screen here. And this is what I'm going to represent. Uh, this is kind of the ER diagram converted to a graph. And then we have the graph here. So we have an employee who sold an order. That order includes products. Those products are in categories. And those products are supplied by a supplier. So how do we query the graph? Well, we use a technology called OpenCypher. This is declarative query language that we talked about before. Uh, and I say OpenCypher because you can find OpenCypher.org. This query technology has been uh, opened up for other technology companies to implement. And folks like the Spark folks, uh, Spark and Graphics folks, uh, as well as Oracle, have committed to adopting OpenCypher. Uh, as, a, as a model for querying graphs. Um, so this is becoming the standard here, uh, OpenCypher, and it is easy for anyone to learn, uh, particularly easy for someone who already knows other declarative query language like SQL, but it's optimized for graphs. So to revisit the property graph model here, uh, we had our nodes and our relationships, uh, these nodes are also people, like we saw earlier with Dan and Anne, but this is showing a report to relationship, where Stephen reports to Andrew. So if we wanted to query these, this is a very simple query. We're finding a subordinate on the right-hand side who reports to an employee on the left-hand side. We're drawing that arrow in ASCII art from the subordinate to the employee. And we're returning star, which means that it's going to return all the nodes and relationships. And so we get a graph that looks like this. Now, visually, this graph is actually quite easy to read, to see how people report. There appear to be two managers in the organization. Um, and Stephen is a manager who reports to Andrew and has a number of reports in addition to Andrew's direct reports. Now, we can also adapt our query 
to return the properties uh, directly instead of returning the nodes and the relationships. And in this case, we can get our data back out as a table. Now, this might be something that you're familiar with. So Neo4j isn't about just representing your results as graphs. It is about writing the code in your application that makes the most sense and representing the results in the way that makes most sense for your application. So you can get the results back from the Neo4j APIs as a table, and you can also get the results back as a set of nodes and relationships between nodes. However, it's best for your application to work with the results, but remember it's much more efficient and easier and more intuitive to query when it's represented as a graph. So if we want to find who does Robert report to, this is again a very easy query to write. We're finding a subordinate who reports to an employee and the subordinate's first name is Robert. Now you'll notice that P equals at the top here, that's saying we want to get the path returned. And what that means is that we want to get all the nodes and relationships in that path. So we get something like this. Robert reports to Stephen. Now getting to something that's a little bit more graph-like here, let's say we want to get the path between a subordinate who reports to an employee, but we can see that asterisk next to the reports to relationship. That means that we want to traverse any number, regardless of the number of levels of relationships between Robert and uh, other managers, we want to get all of them. So in this organization, it's very simple. We can see that Robert reports to Stephen and Stephen reports to Andrew. In a much larger organization, you'd see many more nodes here, but the way that you query it is the same. You just have that asterisk next to the report to relationship. So we want to find the big boss in uh, the organization. This is very simple. We're looking for an employee where that employee doesn't report to anyone. And that is the big boss, and the big boss is Andrew. Now, one more very graph-like query here is product cross-selling. Let's say that we want to find out what other products are sold by sales representatives that also sell chocolate. So the sales representatives that sell Chocolat, what other products are they also selling? So in this case here, we're saying Shock product with product name Chocolat. And you can see that JSON-like syntax for those of you who are familiar with JSON. Uh, that is equivalent to the where query, but just in a shorthand form. So we're finding a product whose name is Chocolat, and we're finding an employee who sold an order that includes that product. And then we're finding an employee who sold another order that includes another product, and or that same employee who sold another order which includes a different product. And returning the list of employees and the products that they sold in addition to Chocolat, and how many times. It's a really easy query to write and get the results here to see that Noki was the one product that is most often sold by representatives who sold Chocolat. And then the second one, I'm not even going to attempt to read because I'm not Swedish. And as an aside here, graph compute. Neo4j is a graph database. It is meant to store that transactional, ACID compliant data, your key business data, and run these pattern queries on it. Uh, and these pattern queries generally start at a couple points in the graph and traverse out from there, usually not touching the complete graph. They're touching only a subset of it. So we do have some graph compute or algorithms available with you for J. So let's say that you want to find the shortest path between two airports, SFO and MSO, up to two degrees of separation. You can do that with the built-in shortest path functionality. We also have the Dijkstra algorithm available in a slightly different form, but in general, Neo4j is not designed for compute operations where you want to touch the entire graph. For that purpose, um, you can choose to use things like Spark 
And there are technologies like Maze Runner, which allow you to synchronize data between Neo4j and Spark to do analysis on the complete graph, where you're not looking for real-time results, you're just looking for that batch analysis on the complete graph. There are also people who have written Neo4j extensions that will traverse the complete graph in Neo4j. Depending upon the size of your graph, you might want to look at those as well. But the built-in functionality in Neo4j is definitely much more around querying a subset of the data in your graph and doing that very quickly. So you're powering an app. Your app can be something simple like this. This is using that employee relationships data um, and just indicating who each of the employees in the organization reports to. Uh, the graphy like ones are at the bottom where you say Ann reports to Andrew via Stephen. Easy query to write as you saw. But your application can get more visual. Uh, this is an application that I built, uh, or data in an application that I built uh, at network.graphdemos.com. And this application allows you to spin up a Docker instance uh, on our servers and query Neo4j uh, while loading in all of your data from Twitter. Um, and it's pretty easy to generate visuals like this uh, with a graph database and efficient to generate visuals like this with a graph database that shows the relationship between different entities. Now with Neo4j, you are going to be writing application code as we talked about. This is some simple Python code where all it does is connect to Neo4j at a particular uh, host name and port and specifies a username and password. And then you pass in your Cypher query and in your Cypher query, you can have arguments that you then fulfill in the actual query, and you can execute your query and then just go through each of the results in your query. Really simple, very analogous to the code that you already write uh, with your relational database, but uh, using the Cypher query language that is optimized for graphs. When you want to load your data into Neo4j, you load your data in using the world's most common data format, CSV. Um, I understand this is also at times the world's most hated data format, but it is the most common and the easiest one to write. And if we consider the Northwind data set, we might have a set of CSV files that look like this. This these represent each of the tables that are in our relational database. And the CSV files look like this. They have a header row, and then for each of the additional rows, uh, you can see those in your data. So you can import that data, you then create indexes on that data, and then you create the relationships on that data. When you import that data, you do it using the same cipher language that you do to query the data. So we're going to step through just a couple examples here. Um, I have more in the slides, but let's just step through a couple. As we're loading in our customers from our CSV file here at the top, we are just doing a simple cipher create statement. So we're loading the CSV file in and looping through each row in the CSV file, as indicated by the row variable here. And for each row in the CSV file, we are creating a customer node with a set of properties, company name, uh, customer ID, the fax number, the phone number. And it's really, really simple to do that. We're just saying the property name is company name and we're getting the CSV file, uh, the columns named company name, and we're populating that. If you wanted to make sure that you didn't duplicate all of these customers, you could also, instead of the word create at the front here, you could use the word merge, which would see if that customer already exists in the database and then only create it if it does not. We're doing the same thing with each of the other things like suppliers and employees, categories and orders. We're just going through the tables in the CSV files and creating nodes for them. And then we create a bunch of indexes. These indexes are only used to find the starting points in the graph. 
before doing the traversals. As I mentioned before, as you do the traversals, it is not using indexes, and that gets you the performance that people want from a graph database. When you create relationships, it's simply a matter of loading in the files which represent the relationship, matching on the existing nodes that are already in the database, and then doing this last statement here called merge, customer, purchased, order. So we found the order that's represented in the CSV file. We found the customer that's represented for that order, and now we're creating a relationship between the customer and the order and calling it the purchased relationship. So we can continue doing that for our other CSV files. And that's that. Now this uses the uh, load CSV command in Cypher, which is great for loading medium-sized data sets. If you do want to load massive data sets, you can do that very quickly in Neo4j with the Neo4j import command line utility, which is available in Unix, and there's a similar tool in the PowerShell tools for Windows. Um, and with Neo4j import, you can import four and a half million things and their relationships in a hundred seconds, super fast. So to wrap up here, I just wanna review this one quote here again. And this quote is from eBay. And I emphasized before that they found Neo4j to be thousands of times faster than their previous MySQL solution. But the biggest thing here for me as a developer is that they also required 10 to 100 times less code. This meant it was a lot easier for the developers to write, and it's a lot easier to maintain. And less headaches focused on maintaining your application allows you as a developer to write more and more applications. So thank you very much.